Good morning, everybody. Those lights are quite bright, so hopefully I'm actually looking at you out here. Good morning again, uh, and welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to our 2015 Wellness and Epilepsy Conference. My name is Steve Guarini, and I currently serve as the chair of the board of directors of the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. I've had the uh, privilege and pleasure of serving on the board for 12 years, since 2003. During those years, I've watched the foundation expand its role of advocating for those with epilepsy, as well as offering support for their respective families and friends. One of the programs we started many years ago is this conference. If you have not attended previously, you'll see as the day progresses how much you're going to learn and really be happy that you came today. And we're thrilled at, at the attendance here today. Like all of you, I'm passionate about this cause and I'm grateful to see so many of us here today. Being educated about epilepsy is a critical step in leading the fight to stop seizures. I'd also like to draw your attention to something that's a little bit different in your materials packet today, and that is a donation envelope. Here's mine right here. The reality is, is that it's only through generous public support that we're able to carry out our mission. Funding in the nonprofit world is really hard, and through generous support of people like yourselves is how we're able to hold conferences and transformational programming like this. I'm asking you today then to consider making a donation. You can do so by simply filling out the envelope and returning it to our representative at the registration table. Or if you prefer, you can make a gift electronically, again at the registration table. We sincerely thank you for, and no gift is too small, and we sincerely thank you for any consideration that you have. And no gift is too large. Thank you, Tony. Before we go any further, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our generous sponsors who have also helped to make this day possible. And if any of you are in the room, if you want to stand up and wave, that would be great. Our premier keynote sponsor is St. John Providence Health System. Our health and resource fair sponsor is the University of Michigan Health System. Our premier wellness sponsor is Spectrum Health. Our outreach sponsor is Beaumont Neurosciences Beaumont Children's Hospital, our networking sponsor, Henry Ford Health System, our wellness partners, Lundbeck, Synovian, Upshur Smith, our education contributor, Sparrow Health System, and our community partner, UCB. Let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you. as I get my paperwork here. As many of you know, November is National Epilepsy Awareness Month. Like the community here in Michigan, epilepsy advocates around the country are taking action to tell all Americans the facts about epilepsy. Through the foundation's community education, epilepsy management programs, and collaborative projects, we are making a difference in people's lives. To learn more about how you can support the, the efforts of Epilepsy Awareness Month, please visit the Epilepsy Foundation, Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan's website at epilepsymichigan.org. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce to you this morning our keynote speaker, Tony Coelho. Tony is sponsored this morning by St. John Providence Health System. Tony, who has epilepsy, was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1979 and served there until 1989. During this time, Tony was the primary sponsor of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. We can clap. And the ADA is widely recognized as the most important piece of civil rights legislation in the past 40 years. 
Tony is the former chair and a current board member of the National Epilepsy Foundation Board of Directors. And we are really honored and privileged to have him here today with us. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Tony Coelho to the podium. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for that generous introduction. It's great to be here today. I, I love the crowd. I think this is fabulous that you are all uh, coming out to support the uh, efforts here today. Uh, I'm here be for one reason. Arlene told me I had to be. So let's put that on the table to begin with. The, the second thing is, I want you to know that I have epilepsy, and I thank God for it. And the reason I do is that my epilepsy forced me to know myself, forced me to understand myself, forced me to deal with things that I would have never dealt with before, forced me, in effect, to try to get out and do things for those of us with epilepsy. And it made me a much better person. So I want to tell you why I did the ADA, why I got involved. And when I was 16 years old, I was on our family dairy farm, and I was uh, going down a canal bank and turned the pickup truck over in the ditch, in the canal, actually. And I hit my head, um, and I got out. And as I was there, I had a headache. Uh, but that part of my body I wasn't worried about. I was worried about the other end because I just told a pickup, and I know what my funk folks would do. So anyhow, I didn't have any problems for a year. After a year, I uh, was in the barn milking cows, and the next thing I knew, I woke up in bed. My brother had carried me to the house and had called out the doctor. And, and so I woke up, and, you know, in Central California, in the, in the agriculture area and so forth, we practiced medicine differently. When I woke up, my doctor was sitting on me because I had seized and so forth. You know, that's an interesting practice by a doctor, but I woke up and I couldn't speak. I could hear what they were saying, but I couldn't speak. And as a 17-year-old, it's a little frightening when that happens. And they were talking about different things. And uh, I asked at one point when I could speak, what happened? And they said, we don't know, but we're going to do tests, blah, blah, blah. OK. So I did. I, we did tests and all that stuff. And, and uh, we went to a lot of different doctors. And no doctor knew what I had. The facts were is every doctor knew what I had. But my parents rejected it. My family is Portuguese, very devout Catholics, and so forth. And they thought then that I was possessed by the devil. And that was a cultural thing with a lot of different cultures, not just the Portuguese, but a lot of different cultures, that if you have seizures, that you are possessed, and that God is trying to do something or whatever. And in our culture, it was. God was targeting our family because somebody had committed a, a major sin and that it was embarrassing to my family to have me out having seizures uh, when it meant that somebody had done something wrong. Now, my folks didn't tell me any of this. Uh, after about five different doctors, we went to witch doctor. And it was an interesting experience to go to a witch doctor. Uh, the lights down. Uh, pour oil on your head, pour oil on your chest, burn a candle on your chest, uh, all kinds of interesting speaking, uh, which I didn't understand. Um, and after the third witch doctor, uh, it didn't help, and I told my family I would never go again. A little struggle. Uh, they were not happy with that, but I wouldn't go. I continued having seizures, and I was student body president in high school. My superintendent said, you got to get out of here. And so I went to Los Angeles to go to college, continued having seizures. I thought they were just passing out spells. And that, you know, once I passed out, afterwards I could get up and I could function. So it was a passing out spell to me. I was very active in college, student body president and, and so forth, outstanding senior. And when I graduated, because of what happened to President Kennedy, he was assassinated, as you all know, 
And because he'd given up his life to serve the country, I decided that, you know, instead of going into law, which I was going to go become a lawyer, instead of going into law, I want to do something that helps people, serves people, as opposed to uh, going out and just trying to make money. And I decided that I wanted to become a Catholic priest. Now, that was to the shock of my girlfriend of five years. Um, <laughs> and it was a shock to my fraternity brothers because they knew better. Um, but that's what I wanted. So I graduated with honors and so forth. And I was at Jesuit college. And the Jesuits were all excited that I was coming in. But I had to go get a physical. When I went to get the physical, um, Father John Lloyd Sr., I mean, doctor, John Doyle Sr., he said, after we, he examined me and so forth, he said, um, have you had headaches or passing out spells? I said, oh, yeah, for about six years. He said, uh, has anybody ever told you that you have epilepsy? And I said, you know what? I've never heard the word. And he said, well, you have it. And he said, I have good news and bad news. The good news, 1964, uh, you're 4F, and you don't have to serve in the military, Vietnam. The bad news is you can't be a Catholic priest because canon law established in 400 AD said if you have epilepsy or possessed by the devil, you can't be a priest. Of course, I was shocked and I was on this high and all of a sudden I went to a low. But I was also happy at the time because all of a sudden I knew what my seizures were about or what my passing out spells were about. So when I called my parents to say that, you know, I have good news and bad news. I told them the bad news first, they were happy. Uh, I told them, uh, and I told them the good news first, and then I told them the bad news. And their immediate reaction was, no son of ours has epilepsy. And that was the end of our relationship for many years. Right after that, I found out that I lost my driver's license. I'm 21 and I'm in Los Angeles, California. So what did I do? I just drove anyway. All of a sudden, I knew I lost my insurance. When I was a senior in college and getting ready to graduate, I had all kinds of companies want to hire me. All of a sudden, when I went to these places and I filled out the, ap the application form, in those days, they could ask if you had epilepsy. And I never got a job. During that period of time, I'd go to Griffith Park in Los Angeles. And by 2 o'clock in the afternoon every day, I was drunk. I felt sorry for myself. I thought that everything I'd ever loved in my life had turned against me. My parents, my church, God, everything. And I was just overwhelmed. I became suicidal. I didn't know what to do. And then one day, I'm drunk, and I'm on a mountain. It's actually, if you go to Griffith Park, it's a little hill. But in those days, when you're drunk, you think everything is big. <laughs> so I was on this mountain, and all of a sudden, I heard merry-go-round music. I had never heard it before. And all of a sudden, I heard it, and there was a merry-go-round at the bottom of the hill. And these little kids getting off and on the merry ground and happy and singing and so forth and so on, and something came over me and said, you're going to be just like those little kids. You're going to be happy, and you're never, ever going to let anything or anybody take advantage of you. And I've felt that way ever since. I've never ever let anybody push me back. I've never let anybody stop me from dreaming what I wanted to dream. And that's really why I'm here today. After that, about a one week later, one of my priest friends said for me, I have an opportunity for you. Now, instead of being negative, I was positive. And I said, what is it? He said, 
you have an opportunity to live with a Bob Hope family. Now, most of you in this room are too young to know who Bob Hope is, but he was a famous TV comedian. Um, and so I interviewed and I went to uh, live with him. Um, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I'll tell you the first experience I had, I go there in this gated home, a big, big home, and I drive in and there's you know, a five car garage and so forth, and uh, I meet the hopes and then they said, we have a room that we're preparing for you, but it's not ready yet, so we'll put you in the guest room. So I go to the guest room, it's above the garage, and I walk in, and there's fresh flowers and a bowl of fruit, and it's really fancy and so forth. So I look up, and I said, I have no idea what you got me into, but I'm willing to go. <laughs> and so I lived with the hopes for one year. The great thing about that, he's a great individual, wonderful, wonderful person, became like my father. And one day we're driving around, he said, Tony, you're struggling because you think you have a ministry and you don't know where, what to do with it. He said, let me tell you, a true ministry is in entertainment, it's in sports, it's in business, it's in everyday life, and you think it's only in a church. It's not true. He said, where you belong is in politics. I don't mean working for the government, I mean in politics. You need to be involved with a member of Congress or something. I'd never thought about it. So I wrote a letter to my congressman who I didn't know, and I said how great I was, you know, and all that stuff, of course. And I got a call two weeks later from his chief of staff saying, the congressman is gonna be in Los Angeles. Would you be available to meet with him? Yeah, of course I said no. Now then I said, absolutely. And so I met with him and it was a great interview. At the end of the interview, he said, I want you to come work for me. I was excited, you know? So I told Mr. Hope that what I was doing. He said, how come you didn't come to me? He said, I know all kinds of very famous members of Congress. Who in the heck is this guy you're going to work for? I said, he's my congressman. That, I really want to do that. So he says to me, how are you going to get there? I'm going to drive. He said, do you have money to drive and to live when you get there? I said, no. He said, well, let me give you some money. I said, no way. And I wouldn't take any money from him. So he says, let me, let me um, arrange for you to meet with the bank, bank manager of Bank of America. That's my bank. And you can borrow money from him. I thought that was a great idea. So I went to, there to the bank manager's office and and sure enough, when I told him who I was, I right away into the manager's office. And so he says, you know, a little bit of chatter, chatter. And he says, well, how much do you want to borrow? Now, I'm 21, and I'm thinking, uh-oh, I didn't think about that. And what should I ask? So my head is going real quick, and I said, $1,000. He said, $1,000? And I'm thinking, oh my God, I asked for too much. Uh, <laughs> geez, I, I blew that. That was not a bad, not a good decision. So he said, look, Bob Hope wants you to have this. You can have as much as you want. And he, he is, he is uh, recommended and so forth. Now, what I didn't know then, that he co-signed it. I wouldn't even know what co-signing was in those days. But he had co-signed it, so it made no difference to this guy. But I got the $1,000 on a piece of paper when I paid it off, Bob Hope's name is on it and so forth. So that experience was a great one for me and I thank God for it. I went to work for a congressman for 14 years. It was an exciting time. I became his chief of staff. I, I, I'd have, even though I was taking medication, I still had seizures. And you know what, I'm 73. So I still have seizures. So those of you in the room who have seizures and so forth, know that if you don't have them, love you, that's great. If you have them, it shouldn't stop you from dreaming and believing. It didn't stop me. So my boss would, you know, and I have a seizure, he would immediately tell people what was going on and there was no problem and so forth and so on. And when I got through, I'd go back to work. That's the way it was. 
after a few years, he said, you know, when I retire, I would like you to take my place. Well, you know, here I go again. Thank God for all that, right? So it took him five years to retire, which was a long time, but, uh, but finally he decided to retire, um, and I uh, ran for Congress. During that time was interesting because, you know, I worked hard at it and so forth, and one night my opponent was in September, and it was pretty obvious that he was going to lose at that time. But he, he goes to a dinner party, and he tells the people there, he says, I want you to vote for me, blah, 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 blah. And then he says, I want you to know that Tony's a very sick man. What would you think if he went to the White House to argue a major issue for us, such as water, Central California waters everything, and, and argued uh, about water, and he had a seizure in the middle of that. Well, people in the room got really upset, and so I got a lot of phone calls that night saying, your opponent just said X, I'm for you, blah, 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 blah. That was great. A reporter the next day calls me and said, Tony, your opponent last night said X. What's your reaction? And I said, you know what? I've been in Washington 14 years. And I've known a lot of people who've gone to the White House and had fits. At least I'd have an excuse. <laughs> and nobody, <laughs> and I'll tell you what, nobody's ever questioned my epilepsy and my ability to function or do anything since that time. So it happened. So when I got elected, I decided that the one thing I wanted to do was to do something about disabilities, do something about epilepsy. And so I'd offer amendments on housing bills, education bills, or whatever, and to include those of us with epilepsy, because our, our disabilities. And you know what? Through all these years that I've been involved, it's hard to get political groups, whatever it is, to do something about disabilities. It's always pushed in the back. I, use, I call it the Jerry Lewis syndrome. Most of you have seen the telethons that he's had. So what Jerry would do is that he'd bring out somebody in a wheelchair or somebody blind or whatever. He'd introduce them, and he would probably cry or whatever. Then he'd pat him on the head and said, whoop, go back in the corner, we'll take care of you. Those of us with disabilities, those of us with epilepsy, don't want that anymore. We want to be recognized as somebody who can do something ourselves, and we don't want to be patronized. So I realized that what was going on, but what was happening also at that time is that if you went to get a job, on the job application was all kinds of disabilities, and you had to check it. Well, immediately, you weren't going to get a job. The second thing I realized is that if you were in a wheelchair and you went to a movie theater, they could kick you out because you were a safety hazard. If you went to a restaurant, they could kick you out if you were sight impaired because you couldn't read the menu. All of these things were going on repeatedly in, uh, at this time in the late 80s. So with that experience and with what I went through, I decided that what I wanted to do was to basically give people with disabilities their civil rights, give them an opportunity to sue if there was discrimination, give them an opportunity to participate in society like everybody else. That's all we want. We want the right to fail. Because if we don't have the right to fail, we don't have the right to succeed. And so that's what it was all about, and that's why I started working on the ADA. It was an interesting experience, because in the Congress, when I put out a letter to all my colleagues and said I was putting in this bill in regards to disabilities and so forth, you can't believe all the people who came up to me. They would say, you know, my wife, my husband, my daughter, my next-door neighbor, my aunt, my uncle, my father, whatever, has a disability. And I don't like the way they're being treated. And so they'd sign up. They hadn't read the bill. Most members of Congress don't read bills. And so they hadn't read it. They just knew that it was the right thing to do. 
And it was an overwhelming support. That made me even feel better. And so it took only uh, about four years to get the ADA passed. But let me give you, and that generally doesn't happen with any major bill. But let me give you a little experience what happened in the process. The leadership of the Congress, the Democratic leadership, I'm a Democrat, but the, and I was in the leadership, but the leadership in effect thought that if we did the ADA, it was such a massive undertaking that the public would revolt after we passed it and we'd have to repeal it. And so they're trying to convince me not to put it in. And I said, I'm doing it. And you can work against it, whatever, but I'm doing it, I want it passed. And so what the speaker did is he assigned the ADA to six different committees, 17 different subcommittees. You know, that's because he was for it, obviously, right? But it was any way to kill it. What we did strategy-wise is we picked the committee that would be the easiest to get it through, and then we kept on going so that there was momentum. And we got to transportation, which was the last one. It was the hardest one. The reason was is that Greyhound and other companies were saying that you couldn't convert the buses to permit people to get on the bus in a wheelchair or elderly or, or anybody that had a disabling condition. And my point to the Greyhound people was that, look it, if this passes, people in technology will come up with ways for the bus to handle it. And you all know today that buses dance and sing and bow and frape and do everything else because technology is now available to permit the buses to lower down. But in the Transportation Committee, that became a big issue. Why? Because of money. And they were putting money in to try to defeat us. So I go to the chairman of the subcommittee where the problem was. And I said, you remember when I helped you get through the Japanese Reparation Act? against the leadership. He said, yeah, and I appreciate it. And I said, well, you know what? This is my reparation act. And I really want to trade in what I did for you, now for you to do for me. So we understood that. And he said yes. And we passed it in that committee 21 to 20. But after that, it was sailing. And the ADA has now been in, in force for 25 years. And in that period of time, it's made a huge difference. One of the things that's happened that you don't realize is that the ADA is now the law of the land in 52 different countries. So we've spread it out. We're making a difference for people worldwide. But what's it done here? Go to any street corner, any street corner you want. Just stand there for a bit. And watch who uses the curb cuts. Of course, people in wheelchairs the elderly, mothers and fathers with their babies in strollers, delivery men and women to the businesses on that street. So what every accommodation that people are making for those of us with disabilities has also become accommodation for the general public. And all we're asking for is the right to participate, the right to get to business, the right to, to do things. And that's all we want with these accommodations. And we want to spend money to, to do what we need to have done. So it helps out everybody. And what is happening also is that we have the right to sue when we're discriminated against. We've never had that. Also, on a job application, you can't ask about the disability. And the Justice Department will sue any company, any business, any city, any state that isn't complying with the ADA. So it's made a huge, huge difference. But you know what? The ADA didn't do anything in regards to jobs, didn't do anything in regards to transportation in order to, you know what? When you get an opportunity to get a job, how do you get there? if you don't have your license? How do you get there if you can't drive a car? So that's what we're working on now. And you know what? Technology is the best friend 
for those of us with disabilities. You know, you take out this phone. It is accessible to people with disabilities. Why? Because they're required in the production stage to include the people with disabilities. And that's what technology has done. The other thing is that I understand that you have Uber around here. And what does Uber do? Uber says they'll pick you up at your home or pick you up at a business or pick you up at church, whatever, and take you where you want to go. And when you punch in, all of a sudden you see the little car coming towards you and the name of the driver is on it, their phone number is on it. And if they discriminate against you, you can call the Uber folks and, and say what happened and they'll be fired if they really discriminated. Technology. I'm a big advocate of Uber, but not, they don't pay me and I'm not pushing them directly. I'm pushing what they've done. And I've told the Uber people that if within five years, if you don't stay up with what's needed, somebody else is going to come in and take it over for you. And that's exciting because now, with Uber, you can go to the mall to shop. You can go to church. You can go to a job. Or you can just go to a movie theater. All the things that those of us with disabilities couldn't do on our own. We had to depend on somebody else to get us there, to do things for us. And then the workplace. 25 years ago, I realized that the data for those of us with disabilities wasn't there. And so that we had been about 30 years ago, 40 years ago, I can't remember now, part of a bill that said all federal contractors and subcontractors have to hire people, with, uh, people of color, women, and people with disabilities. Well, it's fairly easy most times to know if it's a man or a woman. It's fairly easy to know if, if it's a person of color. But who is disabled? So I had to go to all the federal agencies, work with them, to all get them all to agree the, on the definition of disability. That wasn't easy, but we got that done. Then I realized that we need to get the numbers. Where are people with disabilities? You can't get a federal contractor to, to uh, be required to hire people if there are no people with disabilities in the area. So then I had to convince the Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics to get the data on where people with disabilities exist. And that took a while to get it on the census uh, form. And so there is a question now. Now we know where people with disabilities are all over the country. And so now, President Obama then issued an executive order uh, last year that said that all federal contractors and subcontractors have to hire people with disabilities. Now the first year was sort of aspirational to get it. The second year is enforcement. I am told by the people who handle federal contractors that in the first year, 464,000 people with disabilities will be hired. A major breakthrough. Sometimes I think that is more important than the ADA, but if we didn't have the ADA, that wouldn't be effective. So it's, but getting a job is the most important thing for us because it, in effect, provides us the opportunity to participate in society like everybody else. And that's what we want. We don't want anything more. We just want to be involved as everybody else. We want to be denied a job because of our inabilities, not because of our disability. And we're required to work just like anybody else. But we then have the opportunity to do what other people do. The last five presidents, I told, told them personally, I've said, you know, there's only one group in society that I know of that wants to pay taxes. And that's those of us with disabilities. Because it means our independence, it means our pride, it means we can participate and it means that we can either rent a house or buy a house, get a car or whatever. 
We can do things that everybody else has done. That's all we want. So I continue pushing on that. I want to tell you one story. Maybe more than one, but one story that tells you a little bit about myself and, and how whenever I get the podium, I take advantage. When I was in the Congress, I was elected to the whip spot, which is the number three position in, in, in Congress. And when you're whip, you can take foreign trip and take some colleagues with you and go to different places. Well, State Department asked me, where do I want to go? Well, I'm Portuguese, the highest ranking Portuguese American in the history of the country. I want to go to Portugal because that's a state visit. They roll out the red carpet. I got to speak at their parliament and, and the president uh, had a dinner for me and all that stuff. Kind of nice stuff. Then I said, I wanted to go to the Vatican. And I wanted to see the Pope. So they arranged that. They also wanted me to go to Morocco and meet with the king in order to try to help in regards to the relationship between Portugal and Morocco as they were trying to help in the Middle East. So I did that. But I meet with the Pope. The prearranged speech that's been approved by our State Department and the Vatican. So when we get there, the Pope walks in. We all stand up, of course. He sits down. Everybody sits down except me. And I go to the podium, because I'm now going to read a very boring speech that's been pre-approved, but you have to do that. So I read the very boring speech. At the end of the boring speech, I say, Your Holiness, I have to say something personal. Now, when I said that, all those little minions around the room are going, doo -doo 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 -doo. My delegation is looking at me like, You're crazy. And my wife really was upset, because I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell anybody. And I said, I couldn't live with myself if I didn't say something personal. As a young man, I decided I wanted to become a priest. And I was denied entry because canon law in 400 AD said if you have epilepsy or possessed by the devil, you can't be a priest. I have epilepsy. I think it's very unchristian of our church that that provision is there, and I would hope that you'd look into it. Now, you know, that's a little bold of me. The thing has been in existence for since 400 AD, and we're now asking this guy in 1980 to do something about it. That was it. He gets up, does his very boring speech. We get through with that. We take a bunch of pictures. Uh, we couldn't have cameras. They charge $5 a photo. That's why the Catholic Church has all these gold railings everywhere and so forth. <laughs> but we do it. I buy all kinds of pictures, of course, and have them all in my office and everywhere else with the Pope. It was John Paul, who is now a saint in Catholic eyes. Um, but when we got through, he gets up, we get up. My wife and I escort him to the door. He turns to her and blesses her. Turns to me, does not bless me. Turns to me and says, young man, I heard your comments. Now, I really thought I was going to hell because I didn't get blessed. <laughs> and so... We, he walks away, I walk away, and I'm trying to think, you know, what does that mean? Did I upset him? So forth and so on. But I didn't care because I had to say it. Two years later, canon law has changed to permit people with epilepsy to become priests. <laughs> now, I tell this story just for you to realize how emphatic I am about helping those of us with epilepsy or disabilities. I'm not taking credit for that change in canon law. I only know what I did, and I don't know why it was changed. I think maybe I had something to do with it, but I'm not taking credit for it. But my whole thing is, is I, I try to make a difference. I try to make a difference everywhere I can. The Epilepsy Foundation, I've been the CEO during the period of time when they were struggling. I've been chairman of the board, I've been on the board. I'm very active there because 
I think I have to give back. I think I have to try to make a difference. And those of you in the room who have epilepsy or have families with somebody with, an ep with epilepsy, we need your help. And so pull out those cards and make a donation because that's what makes a difference. We can't do it without you, without your involvement. And the fact that you're here today, the fact that you're here today is a great thing. It's a great thing for the foundation here, but it's a great thing for all of us with epilepsy. It means that you care. And that's why I'm here, because you care enough to be here. So I love you for being involved. As I said earlier, I thank God for my epilepsy, because I wouldn't have been able to do all these things. I want you to know that even though I was rejected from the priesthood, that I am still very devout. Because I don't believe that the white, the men in white robes and so forth in the Vatican know what my relationship is with God. And so I'm very spiritual and very involved. The other thing I want to tell you is that my family and I didn't um, communicate, weren't involved for about 20 years. A reporter with the Washington Post was doing a story on me, a huge story. They were trying to prove that I wasn't a success on Wall Street because I'd gone to Wall Street after Congress. And so they were writing this huge story. The guy that wrote it became a friend because he did all kinds of investigations. And when he gave the, the story to his editor, the editor rejected it because he had never talked to my parents to see if what I'm saying to you, and I'd said then, was true. So he calls me and he says, you know, I have this long story and I love it, but my editor won't let me uh, do it. And it's because I haven't talked to your family. Would you mind if I called your family and, and so forth? I said, well, I don't have no idea what they're gonna say, but you're welcome. I gave him the phone number he called him, and about 45 minutes later, he called me back. He said, you'll never believe what your family said. First off, they admitted that they had done this. They admitted that they had put you through all this because um, they were afraid of the fact that you were possessed. And they realize now that that's wrong, but they didn't know how to call you to tell you that they were sorry. So when we hung up, and he said, I'm gonna be, I can now do the story. So when we hung up, I immediately called my family. And said, I understand that you said X, and they said yes, and I said, I wanna come out. So I immediately went out, and we reconnected. Now, I want you to know how strongly I feel about things. When my mother died and we were burying her, and our family, women, were the key, they made the decisions, they did everything. That's true in probably a lot of your families. But when we were burying her, I realized that I couldn't love her and respect her. And I had to decide which one. I finally decided that I loved her but didn't respect her and I immediately had a seizure. Now, I loved her because everything she did, she did it out of love to protect me. But what they did caused me a lot of problems. And so I couldn't respect her. I tell you that story because I want the parents in this room to understand that you can't overlove somebody that has a disability or that has seizures. You have to let us make mistakes. You have to let us do things. And the reason for that, if you don't, then we never learn the opposite. And so it's very important that you realize what we, as a person with a disability, what we're going through every day of our life. We wake up not knowing if we're gonna have a seizure that day. 
We know that people discriminate against us. We know what, what goes on. So you as loved ones have to make sure that you permit us the opportunity to do things and permit us the opportunity to fail. I know that's hard. But please don't let your loved one go through what I did and end up having to make that decision. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for your comments. If you weren't inspired by that, you either weren't in this room or you were asleep. Uh, Tony, I cannot express how much gratitude uh, we have for you being here today. That was just a tremendous uh, presentation and, and story, and I know everybody here appreciates that. We have a small token. Do you want to do questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let I me apologize. do a few sure. questions. Not many, because they'll kick me off the stage. But a few questions that you have. I never like to walk away from a crowd with somebody not realizing what I said or being concerned about something I said. So anybody with any questions? Anything personal? Look, at, I've been asked everything in my life. So nothing is too personal. Yes, ma'am. I, I didn't hear everything you said. I got the gist of it, but I didn't. So why don't you just say it a little bit louder if you can, or maybe stand up. Well, some people don't think I'm clear at all. So <laughs> <laughs> some people think I'm, a, I'm you know, um, possessed, um, and so forth. No, I look at every day of my life, I still have seizures. I had one just a couple weeks ago, uh, a major one. Um, every day of my life, um, I'm very conscious of what I eat and exercise and, and so forth, because those of us with seizure disorders have to be careful of all those things. Keep my... Keep my voice up, whoever's controlling my voice. <laughs> um, and so I, I am very conscious of what I do because those of us with disabilities, those of us with epilepsy, we have an obligation to take care of our body and, and try to overcome what, what we've been given. I take medication every day, twice a day. Um, it doesn't control my seizures. Um, but it does eliminate a lot. Um, and so I recognize that um, uh, what happens when you're taking a lot of medication. I've taken some medications where I go into depression because it had that side effect. So I've been through about nine different medications. I realize that some medications have tremendous side effects. And um, I think that's something you have to deal with your doctor on to see if they can put you on a different medication that doesn't have those side effects. Um, that's all I can say about that, but I, I do understand that, look at, if somebody has 50 seizures a day, 10 seizures a day, their quality of life is different than mine. And I understand that. And that's why I work so hard in the Epilepsy Foundation to see if we can make life better for those of us with disabilities. Of course, I support going for a cure. But in the meantime, those of us with seizures today want something that helps our quality of life so that we can function and so forth. So that uh, your youngster who has uh, a problem with medication and so forth. So we don't have that. And I'm committed to doing that. Next question. Tony, yes. we have a question back here. I'm sorry. Oh, what, what? Hi, I'm right here. Okay. We've got a question right. right here. 
in what ways can people, can parents over love their uh, children who have disabilities? I think you said in the beginning, just tell me what you said in the beginning. I, in what ways can parents yeah, okay, overlove? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I knew that part of my comments would bring up some questions. Um, what I mean is that love those of us with a disability or love those with epilepsy just like you love your other children. Don't try to love us more because what that means is that you're basically handicapping us. And you don't want to do that. But it means also you're helping those of us with disabilities to exist and to uh, take care of us in all kinds of ways. But what I'm talking about basically is don't treat us different than you would treat another member. That isn't easy to do. And I understand that out of love. But all I'm saying to you is understand that you can over love. Understand that I went through it. And I can bet you that a lot of others, it happens to them as well. Next question. Somebody back here had a question. I think I have a pretty loud voice. Okay, yeah, you do. Go for it. specifics in regard to uh, additional legislation? Well, uh, those of you who read the papers or watch the news today, it's pretty difficult to get any legislation uh, through the Congress, particularly dealing with uh, those of us with disabilities. I don't want the ADA opened up at this time because there are people in the Congress who believe that the ADA is unconstitutional. Even though it's gone to the Supreme Court twice, first time it went to the Supreme Court, they ruled that those of us with disabilities that you couldn't actually see weren't included in the ADA. So um, if you have intellectual disabilities, epilepsy, and so forth, uh, they ruled that that wasn't part of ADA. Now, I wrote the darn thing. You think I wrote it and wanted to exclude me? So I call them the Supremes. So the Supremes made that decision. And so what we did is we put in another bill that made sure that the ADA included all disabilities. And that passed. So that is the law of the land now. So what would I do in regards to something else? I would try to do something in regards to transportation and other areas that wouldn't, that would require uh, or wouldn't permit discrimination. But you know what? It couldn't pass. And so what I do is I work hard to get things in regards to the private sector or get things through with executive orders or whatever as opposed to legislation. And what I do is I speak all around the country like I'm speaking here today. I'm in Chicago on Monday. I was in California uh, earlier this week. But I speak all over to try to get those of us with disabilities and those of us with epilepsy more engaged, more involved. That's the way we're going to make changes. And we have to do that. Now, I know that this might be considered partisan, but I don't mean it to be. I feel strongly that one of the things we've got to do is to get involved in presidential campaigns as a disability community and to be recognized as a group that should be part of whatever's being done. I was chair of the Gore campaign. I couldn't get the so-called professionals there to realize that those of us with disabilities participate. Those of us with disabilities vote. And we would like whoever's running for president to address our needs. Some of those running for president today want to repeal the ADA. I want that out in the open. I want that discussed. And I hope that some of you would realize what that means if we repealed it. So what I've done is I've gotten involved with the Hillary Clinton campaign 
And for the first time, they're going to announce next week a bunch of different communities, which you would immediately understand, labor, veterans, Hispanics, blah, 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 all these different communities. But for the first time in a presidential campaign, they're going to acknowledge the disability community. And I'm going to be head of that whole effort. And what that means is to be involved in the policy issues, to be involved in uh, technology and so forth, all these different areas that permits those of us with disabilities to be considered equal with everybody else. And the reason I'm doing this, I'm 73, I shouldn't be involved in this stuff anymore, but I'm 73 and I'm determined to get this successful so that every presidential campaign of all parties realizes that those of us with uh, disabilities have power, have influence, we vote, we participate, and so forth. So that every presidential campaign next time around will have a disability community as part of their effort. That's my goal, and that's what I'm trying to get done. So that's the way I can do it. I can't do it with legislation, because the last thing I want to do is to open up the ADA at this point, and I can't get other legislation through because of the way this Congress is working today. I'm so happy I'm not there, that's what I would say. Okay, well, I think we have Tony? time for, Tony? Uh, what, what's my time? Well, it's 10 minutes after nine, I think, right? Um, so I have nine minutes. Yes, so next question over here. Yes, sir, uh, I've been working the last 15 years on a thing called the epilepsy course. I want people with epilepsy to join with me, bring their stories, healthcare issues, um, and their neighbors. And we're gonna do an art and entertainment industry to uh, hopefully in the end results, everybody gets the royalties from books, movies, and other things in the art and entertainment industry. But it's a continuing thing, healthcare is. There's medical first done every day. There's good caregiving done. Those insides need to be heard and told. And uh, our goal is going to be to try to fund health care. Let's free up that money. Let's get everybody involved. You're right. The one equality we all share, none of us are perfect. And uh, this is going to be an online job people could do from home. You talk about mobility. I hitchhiked all my life, got a retirement from GM, but it worked. And I'm not saying go hitchhike. <laughs> but I learned a lot from the American people and health issues and the importance of a good job in the future is something we all have. But people with epilepsy have a very keen insight to that because they're denied it so much. So I just want you to know, please, uh, I got cards in the next room over, grab them and let me hear your stories. And thank you for your good work. Thank you very, very much. Um, I appreciate the fact that you're working so hard to make a difference, that's what counts. Yes, ma'am. Somebody get a mic over there, please. My question is a question about benefits, the disability benefits. To, in order to qualify for disability benefits, how disabled the person has to be? Well, it depends. I, oh, Go ahead. Let me, yeah, I just add something. We applied for uh, disability benefits for my son last year, and it was denied. Which, which agency, where were you, where did you apply to? Um, what do you mean agency? State, federal, uh, what do you, I, I don't understand where you applied for the benefits. Uh, so, through the social security benefits. Okay, social security, okay. Yes, and we were denied. Um, my son already is on autism spectrum. He was through all his years, through the young years. I never applied for benefits. And um, I found the person, we were referred to the uh, advocate, but after she learned his story, she um, refused to take the case because she said, to get the benefits in nowadays, the disability benefits, you have to be very, very, very sick. When she heard that, my son is intelligent, he's Asperger's. It's um, not anymore, it's just autism spectrum now. But he developed, started developing seizures. The first seizures happened in 2011. And 
up to the date, he had 16 seizures. Okay, let me answer, let me answer your question. Um, the, the denial by the Social Security Administration uh, should not be what you would consider a final decision. But, but, but wait a minute, what you should do is you should go to your congressman and they can fight to get, Social, get the Social Security uh, Administration to do what they're supposed to do. Um, you have to be willing to fight. Uh, let me tell you, all these agencies, it's easier to deny than to, to approve. And if you have a good congressperson, I don't know who it is here, but if you have a good congressperson, they'll go after it and they'll help you. I did that all the time when I was in Congress, so don't let a denial stop you. Uh, it isn't, you don't have to be very, very sick. What you have to be is have, you know, that you have a difficulty in regards to getting a job or you have a difficulty in, in uh, your, your life situation. So don't give up, that's all I tell you. Go after your congressman, congresswoman, and get them to fight for you. That's part of what they're there for. That's what they should do. On their staff, they have people generally who are qual qualified and go after it. And I guarantee you that your congressperson is doing this for other people. Get them to do it for you. Tony, yes. we, uh, over here. We have about 10 more minutes for questions. If you're okay with that, I've got one here. That light is so bright, I can't even okay. see you. Oh, that's, that's all right. You're not missing anything. Oh, there we go. He turned it down. Thank you. Whoever's doing that. Well, I was employed at a hospital, and I got fired because they said I had a seizure. When was this? This was um, 04. 04? And Against the law? I know it's probably too and long what ago. What you need to do is fight it, for it. But after but, 1990, that's against the law. But And you can uh, file something against them. I'm sure Arlene and folks can help you in how to do that. Against the law. But, and that's what you need to go after. But it's probably too late, late for it. But I was, um, they said there was, I, was, I went to the union. And the union leader said, can't fight for it, because there was other union um, members there. And then I went to a lawyer, and they said, well, it's the hospital. It's too big in, the, in our city. So what, should I have gone to my congressman? Yes. Let me just let me answer your question. Start off with, it's against the law, period. So what you need to do, if you went to the union, they actually probably don't know that, and they're uh, not involved with that. So don't take their answer. You went to probably the wrong lawyer. So, you know, you understand there are people who can help, and there are people who won't help. And so you got to find the person who will. And you got to go, the best place to go is to uh, the foundation, Epilepsy Foundation. They know who can help you out. Um, you know, that's an issue that I really feel strongly about. And we have a law firm, one of the largest in the country, who's helping out in these cases. Um, Liz Weisswater, as you know, she, and they do it pro bono. And so what you need to do if you get in a situation like this, don't let them get away with it. That's why I work so hard to pass the ADA, was to make sure that cases like that don't happen. You know what? It still happens. But that's why you got to take action. That's why you got to go after them. I don't feel sorry for any company or whatever if they're firing people just because of a disability. Go after them. And that's what the foundation can do for you. That's why you should all contribute to the foundation <laughs> to make them have the ability to do this. OK, another question. We have one minute. When somebody need, yes. Microphone, sorry. can we get a microphone to her? I'm sorry. Wait a minute, the microphone's coming. Become a caregiver to my brother who has F seizures. And in this process, he didn't come to live with me immediately after my mother passed. There were other siblings who were involved. So 
His disability benefits got all screwed up. So when he came to me, I guess they figured that I would be the hound dog, okay? <laughs> and when he says you have to fight, you have to fight. So I do agree with you, but I will disagree with you on one point. You indicate that you should go to your politicians. When I did that, because I have a tablet full of names and numbers, and those politicians, believe me, no help whatsoever, okay? You have to be a hound dog, okay? And don't be afraid to go after and continue until you get those benefits. Because like he said, it's easy to deny you. And for the politicians, it's easy for them to tell you that they can't get involved. Well, you will get involved in my case. <laughs> and believe me, it took Thank me you very from much. My October time is up. to March to get his benefits I agree. back Thank in you very place. Much. I Sorry. appreciate that. I would tell you this. Only thing I would say is that she's absolutely right. She verifies what I'm saying. But the only thing I'd ever say is that there are politicians who won't help, but there are politicians who will help. So don't categorize all politicians in that box. But you know what? If you have a politician who won't help, tell them exactly what you think about it. Go right to their face and tell them, you know what? You might wake them up. But don't give up. That's all I'm saying. You've got to fight for it. Thank you very, very much. For one second. So, Tony, thank you again. Thank we appreciate you. you being here. Here's a small token of our appreciation. We really hope when you look at that, it'll remind you of all the lives that you've touched today. Thank you. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you.